Regarding debates in the literature in this field, there's a long list, which in a way makes it quite an exciting field. Some of the ones that I've been aware of over the last few years, debates around whether we should be distinguishing scholarship of teaching and learning from scholarly teaching whether we should be distinguishing it from educational research. And my background is in education and higher ed, so I, I bump into that all the time. Uh, I think we've had quite a few debates around the language and the terminology, and um, maybe as befits an evolving field, concerns about what is SODL and what is not. And, um, you know, I bumped into a colleague who's still at this conference saying, I don't really know if I'm doing SODL, but I think I am, and I wanted to come and find out. Um, so. I, I uh, do adult developmental psychology. I think we're having a bit of an identity crisis, but we're moving through it, so it'll be okay. It's a lively field, SOTL, and so there are lots of, of different um, ways where we differ. I mean, uh, it's a wide, diverse range of people in terms of intellectual background and in terms of tastes of evidence. Important debate that has uh, taken place in the social community, if you like, over the past few years, quite a few years, I think, is around um, the f whether we, whether social is a theoretical field or not. So the extent to which we use theory in our reflections and inquiries, and also, so that's one aspect, and also the variety of theories that are being used and the extent to which it being such a diverse theoretical field, it actually can be coming across as, as a rigorous um, field, uh, and I think it is like it is likely that this is one of the debates that uh, a newcomer to Soto would come across. And I think uh, the work of Mary Huber and Pat Hutchins on this is extremely illuminating, and particularly the way they've identified how you can bring your own theoretical frameworks to your practice, i.e your own discipline-based theories to your practice to examine uh, your, your, to examine your practice. Um, that, I think, is very interesting. They've called this the, the big tent, you know, but, you know, Soto being a big tent, uh, which it is, and uh, that, that, to me, is, is, is um, you know, is one of the big debates in Soto. There are many others, of course, but that's the one I would I would find interesting. And I might come to the conclusion that at the end of the day, it, matter, it doesn't matter very much. There, there are so many benefits from engaging in SOTO that whether you are more or less theoretical may not matter as much as one, think initi as one thinks initially. It is a field that's rich with opportunity, and it is a field that's rich with debate. And I say rich with debate, not fraught with debate. There's a big difference. So we could pick a number of debates or controversies, contentions, confusions within the field because it's complex and it's invited a lot of people in, people of a lot of different stripes. So as soon as you do that, you are welcoming differing points of view, differing understandings, differing language. As in many interdisciplinary fields, what we have going on in scholarship of teaching and learning is different cultures coming together. And one of our great challenges is figuring out how do we navigate that? Um, and for people like me coming out of the humanities, one of the challenges is how do we make available models for how to do scholarship of teaching and learning that build on the disciplinary expertise of the people who are doing it? You know, one of the ideas that drew me into scholarship of teaching and learning was the notion that it was grounded in disciplines and that I should be able to use the theories and methods and approaches and assumptions and, and culture and values and all of those things of my discipline in studying students learning in my discipline. And I still believe that very firmly. I would describe transfer as the ability of a learner to make productive use of their knowledge and their skills in new and improved ways uh, based on past experience but in response to new challenges. I think we took the term transfer, well, the word transfer, very directly. I just thought, what knowledge can be 
taken from one language, one culture, one, one academic setting, whatever, and then transferred into another. And where, where, where does this transfer become problematic and where it can be fine? Explaining or defining transfer is um, a tricky enterprise, uh, largely because it uh, draws from so many different fields. And so it means very differently if you're talking about it uh, to people who are in student affairs as opposed to people who are inside certain disciplines. Um, and that's before you get to people who study transfer generally, um, as in education or psychology. Uh, and that actually is even before you get to um, people who are engaged in thinking about transfer without necessarily naming it that way. I'm thinking here of uh, people who hire college graduates, who are very interested in college graduates being able to <clears throat> transfer uh, what they've learned in the college environment. So transfer is really a foundation of a lot of our educational systems. We assume that what students learn in one context or what we teach in one context, that they will take into another context and apply or repurpose or use in that new setting. But we don't necessarily have a lot of evidence or we didn't have a lot of evidence that that actually happens. And so a lot of the folks that have been studying transfer have been looking for evidence of that, not only student learning in the one context, but what do students do with it in the next context? How are they able to reuse, repurpose, remix, integrate, apply, lots of words for it, but what are they able to do with that learning in the next context that they go to or that they go to at the same time? I think if you are really taking learning and the study of learning seriously as a transactional activity between teaching and learning, that really the scholarship of teaching and learning is about the relationship between teaching and learning, that it's not a productive inquiry if you do not have all the voices in that dialogue active. Um, it's a different kind of research if students are silent, if students are merely research subjects, then that's a different kind of research. But I think to be the scholarship of teaching and learning, it has to be transactional. And to be transactional, it has to include students as vital partners in that inquiry. Since starting this, I've become so much more aware of, of how faculty do their jobs and, and what goes on behind the scenes. And so much more forgiving. <laughs> I mean, I think before this, I, if a class didn't go so well or if I had a lot of assignments, I'd think, like, what are they doing? They're just doing this on purpose. They're trying to ruin my life. Um, and it, it was easy to blame the professor for things that weren't going great. And having this perspective, this kind of behind-the-scenes perspective, has given me so much more patience, first of all, for, for just the classroom setting and for understanding how difficult it is to really moderate that and to act as a good like lecturer or discussion leader or anything really like within the classroom. Um, but it's also it's also given me a confidence to talk to professors when things aren't going right. You do learn the humanity behind the professor almost and that, you know, these are the people who just care about the classroom just like you do. And I think having an opportunity to really establish a relationship that's not just um, based on sort of authority and um, student dynamics is really powerful in getting to know your professor and the just people in, in general, which is a life skill that can be taken, you know, so far. And uh, with that, there's also sort of talking to um, professors in a way that is um, helpful, but also still like respectful, and that's something that I've been um, talking to with uh, talking about with other consultants as another life skill. Is talking to people, problem solving, um, so collaboration is huge in terms of the sharing and sort of um, disseminating of ideas. I think the, the 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 issues we're facing is that for many years, Subtle has been investigating the students. We have treated the students as the people that we are investigating. They are our research subjects. 
Um, uh, and uh, I, I go beyond student voice. Uh, I know there's a lot of discussion, that, um, and you've probably had it with previous people you've interviewed. Um, I tend to use the term student as change agents, where they get involved beyond the student voice, um, beyond simply asking students for their opinions, uh, and when students become the co-researchers, the co-designers uh, of the activity. Um, uh, and so there's enormous benefit both for the students and for the faculty of collaborative learning, collaborative working. Um, uh, and it goes actually beyond individual benefits, which there are a lot uh, of, uh, I, to I think what higher education is about and our model of higher education. Um, so it actually begins to test out some you know, institutional boundaries and some uh, you know, wider national boundaries uh, of what higher education is about. Because there's quite a lot of them and us at the moment uh, there. Uh, and I think this model pushes us, just as the student as producer model does more broadly, uh, pushes towards the uh, treating students as part of it, alongside us rather than um, the other side of the fence. You know, it's, it's collaborative learning. So the model that I personally like is a co-learning, co-researching, co-designing, co-X uh, type of model. First of all, selfishly, as a staff member, love to see more um, partnership with staff. So just a broader idea of what um, different voices looks like. So not just students, but the idea of co-inquiry. Students, staff, faculty, and maybe perhaps alumni, now that I'm in that realm as well, would be really interesting, I think, to have that broader spectrum. It goes a little bit beyond subtle, this whole spirit of engaging with students. And it also um, goes towards informing students about the results of our research so that students can benefit from it. Um, maybe you can't do it during the study um, immediately when you're gathering your data, but this is something I would really uh, keep my eye out for. I have believed for several years that one of the most important changes that needs to take place in the scholarship of teaching and learning is to think of it less and less as a matter of individual inquiry and as a matter of collective inquiry. Almost no research that goes on in any field of knowledge that's undertaking really complex problems is done by individuals working alone. If we consider learning and the improvement of education as a major complex problem around the globe, then I think we have to treat it the way we would treat other kinds of complex research. It needs to be undertaken in teams, it needs to be undertaken in labs, it needs to be undertaken in interdisciplinary collaborations where different uh, ways of knowing and different strengths are brought to bear. What's different about the scholarship of teaching and learning is that the focus is often the learning that's taking place in an individual classroom. So we're looking at a somewhat uh, intricate balance between individual, the setting of individual inquiry and collaboration across that inquiry. But I think that uh, within institutions of higher education, for example, one of the most important things that, for example, centers for teaching and learning can do is to create a collaborative ethos and true collaborative momentum around scholarship of teaching and learning, to think of it as collective inquiry, to think of an institution as the building up of individual and collaborative inquiry, programmatic inquiry, and institutional inquiry. So I really think the kind of collectivizing of, of inquiry and thinking of it not as an individual paradigm, but really to think of the scholarship of teaching and learning fundamentally as a collaborative inquiry paradigm is not only important for the growth of the scholarship of teaching and learning, I think it's absolutely imperative if the scholarship of teaching and learning is going to be relevant at all in the next couple of decades.